one. I debated whether this was a white background or a black background. And in the end, I stuck with a white background because we are going to be talking about George Washington Carver as an ideation pioneer. And I think sometimes it's nice to go and explore the histories of some of the food scientists that are still contributing to our ways of doing things, even to this day. George Washington Carver just happened to be a scientist who worked more than 100 years ago. And some of the techniques that he developed or championed, perhaps is a better word, are still being used today. And for the students at Niagara College who are working on our um, end of term project with the nutrition class, you'll see a lot of parallels between what George Washington Carver did in his day more than 100 years ago and what we're doing in class uh, together. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to appreciate the pioneering work of George Washington Carver on commodity ideation and innovation. And we will discuss innovations that George Washington Carver contributed to food science and agri-food industries. And let's move forward. So George Washington Carver just happened to be born as a slave in Diamond Grove, Missouri in the early six, or 1860s. He wasn't exactly sure about his age, but his family was uh, kidnapped and he was um, owned by the slave family uh, called the Carver family. And so for much of his childhood, he was known as the Carver's George. And fortunately, uh, after the abolition of slavery in the United States, he was uh, raised by his former slave owners. He was taught how to read and write and was able to participate in um, schooling so that he was able to help uh, move himself forward and uh, help bring progress for himself. And fortunately, behind him, bring many other people along for that progressive uh, move. So I love this photo. He's mouth pipetting and we would never do this in this day and age. But uh, uh, George Washington Carver left home to attend a, uh, a segregated school system in Kansas. And Missouri at the time did not have the quality of education that he was needing at the time. And he had to move quite frequently because of violence uh, towards uh, black people at the time in the United States. He fortunately found some teachers who helped advocate for his success. And uh, those teachers were quite influential, helping him understand the power of education for empowering oneself as well as one's community. He, uh, As he completed his high school in Kansas, he tried to apply to Highland University, which is also in Kansas, and he was refused entry. So he had to go on a bit of a a journey and he returned to his agricultural roots and was homesteading for a period of time and getting really involved in some of the scientific inquiry behind agriculture and agri-food agri processing and was then able to apply to university again. So he applied to Simpson College, which is a, is a college, I believe in Beloit, Iowa, and there he was studying art and music. However, again, having good teachers in his life helped him realize he was actually really far more interested in botany and so he went to Iowa State College and was the first black student to be admitted to Iowa State College, which is now Iowa State University. And he completed his bachelor's in 1894 and his master's degree in 1896, at which time he became part of Iowa State's teaching faculty and taught in um, plant sciences and mycology and botany, uh, different programs related to plant sciences. And there, during that time, there's a bit of... Uh, I want to say it's partly apocryphal, but partly quite interesting that he was uh, uh, friends with the Wallace family and George C. Wallace and Henry Wallace were um, compatriots of his and they all had very influential roles with the agricultural sector in the United States. And uh, some of the stories say that uh, Henry Wallace was strongly influenced by Carver's teaching and there's, there's not a lot of evidence to that, but they do know that uh, Carver did frequently attend the family home of the Wallaces and likely did make a very big impression and vice versa, that uh, people who really care about agriculture can do a lot to help each other and support each other in their missions. Um, so George Washington Carver was then recruited by Booker T. Washington to join the faculty at Tuskegee University. And there he was recruited to uh, help develop academic programs in agri-food sciences, as well as develop research services in extension education. And he was quite profound in his work with respect to extension agriculture services, and in particular to uh, black and uh, farmers of color and agro-processors at the time. So he really focused a lot of his work on writing non-typical publications 
So not writing in the scientific literature so much as he wrote for uh, trade publications, in magazines, in um, pamphlets that were uh, circulated very widely with small holders so that they could empower themselves through knowledge and through education to uh, improve the uh, improve their livelihoods. And so he wrote many different uh, pamphlet type publications that were dispersed quite widely throughout the southern United States. And we're going to explore one of those in just a moment. Um, this is where the parallels to a student project that we're working on are quite clear. He wrote a pamphlet that um, is still referred to to this day as one of his um, most dynamic contributors to how he impacted the industry. He believed strongly in education in the informal space and especially for smallholders. And he felt very strongly about innovation and research services for the public good. Now, historians often say, well, he was a bit of a he was a bit of a demanding person with, within his teaching, but at the same time, you could say that he knew what was necessary for the success of his teaching. Um, but uh, long story short, this document here, you can find it online and I've shared uh, some links so that you can access it within different internet archives. But uh, it's quite fascinating because he wrote about the peanut and not just how to grow it and how smallholder uh, agriculture holders in sharecropping situations could grow peanuts as a way of improving the soil health. Peanuts as leguminous crops are um, able to fix nitrogen in the soil and it, it, within a crop rotation they are able to increase the soil nitrogen and at the same time able to contribute high quality high protein uh, food uh, for human or um, livestock use and so it was it was quite dynamic for him to go and look at those sorts of uh, systematic approaches to improving agriculture as well as livelihoods and human nutrition. So in this in this pamphlet, I, it's it's really fun. He he was he was very much a uh, an agricultural scientist, but he did a almost like a cookbook where he wrote different recipes and he did 105 different ways to take peanuts and turn them into different food products that could be easily prepared with um, readily accessible ingredients. And he did cookies and fake cheese and fake meat cutlets and peanut butter. This is, I found this page and he uh, he's often credited as being the inventor of peanut butter, but we know very clearly that peanut butter had been consumed by the indigenous peoples of the Americas for centuries and millennia before that. But he was the one who popularized peanut butter as something that could be prepared at the small scale and turn into um, an agri-food product that would be readily accessible by many individuals, both from a cost perspective, but also from an entrepreneurship perspective. And he did have a broader legacy as an agri-food scientist. We still talk about him and there are scholarships in the United States, research centers in the United States that were built off of his legacy. Uh, uh, Carver never married and he uh, lived a reasonably simple lifestyle. And as such, he saved a lot of his money and contributed back to different research foundations as he got older and on his death. Um, he had a broader legacy in terms of um, popularizing the importance of crop rotation and investigated a lot into natural pesticides and fertilizers. In many respects, he was a very early proponent of organic and sustainable agriculture, mostly because these were inputs that were very inaccessible to smallholders. And so if you were a sharecropper in the southern United States, you didn't have a lot of uh, free income to be able to go and buy fertilizer for the improvement of your crops. So instead, looking at composting, looking at uh, crop rotation, looking at the use of different biologics derived from native plant species as a means of pest control and fertilizing. He was a huge proponent of smallholder crops and looking at crop diversification. And equally, what he was very well known for was that commodity value addition. Many, many people accredit Carver to being the lead for development of the peanut industry in the southern United States. Now, there were a lot of other individuals who had influences in there, but he was one of the most vocal advocates for that. And he was such a very important advocate for smallholder farmers and farmers of color in the United States in the early um, 20th century. Last but not least, of course, he was a big advocate for science education and inclusion, and he worked in um, these traditionally 
black universities, uh, Tuskegee in particular, and was very pioneering in terms of inclusion of uh, people on the margins in education systems for their empowerment and for the empowerment of the entire community. And so Carver's legacy is still quite profound. I I put this photo of the statue at Iowa State University because I did attend Iowa State University. And oftentimes when I was feeling um, <laughs> frustrated by some of the work that I was doing, I would go out and I would look at the Carver statue and think, what would Carver do if he was in this situation? And uh, in many respects, he was very much uh, someone who persevered quite heavily through a lot of different challenges, whether those were racism and segregation or um, just the funding atmosphere of different uh, universities at the time that were unlikely to fund people of color. Um, he was able to find ways of persevering and finding ways that he could continue to advocate for his stakeholders, which were mostly smallholder farmers. And I know that that's something that I reflect on quite heavily in my current career, having um, a career that spends a lot of time advocating for small small food processors and small businesses so that they can succeed and be able to contribute to their families. So I like that statue. It was uh, sculpted by Christian Peterson. And I think it's a wonderful reminder of the importance of finding role models in your life. So yeah, I mentioned peanut butter. It, it, uh, often people joke and say, well, uh, George Washington Carver was the inventor of peanut butter. We we saw that document in the in the peanut document. He did not invent peanut butter, but he popularized peanut butter. It, the actual patent for peanut butter is held by a Canadian, Edson, um, or Marcellus Edson. And the actual patent was held by him. And we could argue that that's actually cultural appropriation in its own right, because peanut pastes and peanut purees had been consumed by the indigenous peoples of the Americas for centuries and millennia. But last but not least, I think it was really interesting to think about and reflect on the fact that um, the advocacy for for crop diversity is so important. And it just happened that this morning I was on a phone uh, conference call with some members of the team from the One Country, One Priority Product Program and reflecting on more than 100 years of history of going and looking at special agricultural products with unique qualities and special characteristics that can contribute to efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-foods for better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life, leaving no one behind. That message, you could almost take that exact same message that is being uh, championed by the Food and Agriculture Organization and their programs. This is a message from today, and you could take it back 100 years ago to the work that Carver was doing, and it was the exact same message, that he was looking at local and regional level agricultural products that had unique qualities. His work in peanuts is the most famous, but he worked with sweet potatoes and tomatoes and cow peas and other marginalized crops to appreciate their value and to champion that value to farmers so that they could understand the potential for them and the potential that it could contribute to the success of their livelihoods. So it's kind of neat to see these things that are old actually are absolutely relevant to today. So I'm going to leave you with that. And, you know, I always love the questions that you ask, and I love the energy that you bring to the classroom when we're all together. And I look forward to hearing questions and talking more about cool ideas together with you. Take care, and we'll talk to you again soon.